Hi, uh, thank you everyone for staying uh, for all the way to the end of the event for this uh, highly anticipated uh, QA. Yeah, so um, based on all the questions that we have received online, I, I think one of the highest voted questions uh, was asking about the um, recommendation on REITs uh, last year. And because currently, uh, I do believe investors who are holding on to REITs, especially as REITs, uh, you're looking at uh, quite a substantial losses in your portfolio. So the question is, uh, what should we take? Uh, I mean, how should we take this and, uh, and what is the view discussed today? Yeah. Um, I think uh, just to give everyone a bit of a context, uh, I think last year, if you were here for our FSM uh, Expo, uh, we did express a somewhat positive view on um, SREITs. Uh, I think our general mes uh, message to investors was that uh, I think SREITs, um, it's good to be selective. Um, it's good to focus on the fundamentals. Uh, but that was before the federal rate hikes that we have seen throughout 2022. So in the middle of the year, we have actually turned uh, bearish on um, S-REITs. And uh, right now, uh, have we changed our view on S-REITs? Uh, I think that's no. I think we are still relatively bearish on S-REITs um, simply because um, of the fact that there are now better alternatives in the investment space. Bond use especially, they have shot up um, a lot um, in, in 2022, offering use of about 3 to 4%. S-REITs in the past, giving distribution use of about 5 to 6%, but that was at a time when interest rates was very low, at about less than you know, 1% or maybe even 2 But now with interest rates picking up, with bond yields now um, giving investors um, very decent, very attractive returns, I think the fact that there is now an alternative in the fixed income space it now makes the s suite space a lot less attractive. So the distribution yield for s suites, I think that's about like 6%. In a low interest rate environment, I would say this is an attractive yield to have, but with bond yields now at 3 to 4%, I think this is still relatively unattractive. So what, at what level would we consider s suites to be attractive? I think you probably may have to wait for yields to adjust upwards um, to about 7 to 8%. I think that would be perhaps a level that I will consider as suites to be attractive. Okay, thank you so much uh, for the question about the s suite. So I hope investors know um, our view on s suites and uh, what you do next. So leading up to this question, um, there's another question that's asking about US recession. Like how would it affect us in Singapore? So probably I'll ask uh, Weiren and uh, De Jin. Uh, yeah, I think um, the, the, the question is on whether a US recession will affect Singapore, right? I, I think that's a yes, um, because Singapore, ultimately, we are an open economy, so we are very uh, susceptible to external shocks. So if, let's say, US goes into a recession in 2023, then uh, it, it is very likely that economic activity in Singapore uh, will slow down as well. So we are not immune to a global growth slowdown because we are an open economy. Uh, same thing for interest rates. If so the Fed continues to hike its interest rates, then, then this will have an implication on the interest rate environment in Singapore as well. So uh, we are very dependent on um, external events. But having said that, I think there are also reasons to be, uh, to, to, to be optimistic for um, the, the Singapore economy. I think even though generally growth is going to slow down, I think it will at least be a bit more resilient as compared to um, some of uh, our neighbours, uh, simply because of the fact that um, Singapore, we are starting to overtake Hong Kong as um, Asia's financial centre because of what is happening over in Hong Kong. So a lot of businesses, they are relooking their, bis um, their, their business exposure uh, within Hong Kong. So a lot of them are starting to relocate their headquarters over to Singapore. Uh, over in China, because of uh, the common prosperity drive, a lot of rich Chinese people, they are all relocating their assets to Singapore as well. So we are starting to see um, family offices being set up in Singapore. So our financials industry will have that additional boost from um, all these uh, trends that have been taking place outside. And on top of that, I think, um, you know, when you talk about China reopening, um, they are they're opening their borders. So tourists are starting to look for places to travel. But at a time when a lot of uh, countries are thinking about uh, implementing bans on um, tourist arrivals from China. Uh, so far, Singapore, we, we have opted not to. So we will uh, also have a bit of uh, a boost in terms of our services sector from tourist arrivals from China. So a couple of factors that uh, will help soften the blow, but I guess the general direction for Singapore's economy in 2023 is um, that of a slowdown, uh, albeit 
uh, uh, quite a resilient one. Well, uh, I also agree with what Weirin said. I think Singapore being a very open and trade-reliant economy, we will definitely be affected if other major economies such as the US go into a recession. So if I recall correctly, net exports as a percentage of GDP, it is around 30 plus percent for Singapore. Hence, it's uh, quite a significant exposure. So the similar argument also can be extended to other uh, more trade-oriented markets such as South Korea and Taiwan, for instance. And I think Weirin also brought up a very good point about how Singapore's market is relatively more resilient. So just to put some context into it, you can see that over the past year, I believe that Singapore was actually one of the the better performing markets having much less uh, decline in share prices compared to other markets like the US, Europe or even China for instance. And that is, I would say, one of the strengths of Singapore's market, being resilient in the downturn. Thank you so much for your uh, reply. So there's actually another question also related to the declining of the um, equity prices in the market. Uh, and one of the investors asking specifically about US um, and also the investment outlook on our semicon as well as the uh, tech industry. Uh, whether should we cut loss or buy the dip? I do believe this is one of a very huge awaited question, especially if clients here have actually invested in these kind of FANG stocks uh, during the pandemic period of time. So uh, I'm looking forward to hear all your answers about this. All right, so um, with regards to whether or not to cut losses or buy the dip, when it comes to your investments, I think uh, th this is a very specific question. So I think it very much depends on what you're investing in. So if you think that the market or the sector that you're investing in, the fundamentals, they have changed substantially and they are not likely to uh, give you the same type of returns as uh, it, it did maybe five years ago, then I think perhaps it's time to consider cutting losses. However, if it is like a temporary dip and you think that uh, things will eventually recover and the long-term growth story of that particular market or sector still remains intact, then I think you should make use of this opportunity to buy the dip. So with regards to the US, I think right now for the US, even though valuations have fallen quite a bit, um, I don't think they are exactly extremely cheap like what we have seen in the past. So if you are looking to invest in the US, what I would suggest is you consider value stocks rather than growth stocks. So yeah, in a rising interest rate environment, value stocks, they tend to outperform their growth counterparts. And with regards to semicons, so semicons is a very interesting sector. I think the long-term growth story of semiconductors, it has always been there. I think the argument is very simple. As the world we live in becomes increasingly digitalized, increasingly tech-driven, the need for semiconductors, it will certainly be there. And US semicon companies right now, they are amongst the best in the world. They are the world-class semiconductor companies. No other country or uh, other markets have semiconductor companies that are comparable like um, to the scale of the US. So I think with regards to semicons, even though uh, the consensus is we are going into an economic downturn and likely consumer demand for electronics and uh, other products will be low. I think that this is only a phase and that semiconductors, they will eventually recover to uh, higher levels than before. Yeah, maybe just to add on to what Dajin has, um, has already shared, I think there needs to be a distinction uh, within the tech sector because not all tech companies are made the same. So uh, when you talk about growth companies, um, most of them are your tech companies. So they tend to not do well in a rising interest rate environment. And the reason for that is because uh, most of them, a large part of them are loss making. And a, a big part of their valuations is derived from earnings that are expected to be earned far out into the future. Which is why a lot of all these um, you know, tech companies, most of them are loss making. So they, they have suffered under the crushing weight of a rising interest rate environment. But the thing is, not all tech companies uh, made in the same mold because you have uh, big tech companies, Microsoft, um, Apple, Facebook. So these are companies that are not loss making at all. In fact, they are very profitable, generating a lot of cash flows. If you look at um, the amount of cash that the, the big tech stocks have, as a percentage of the S&P non-financials companies, big tech cash balances make up about 25% of the overall index. That's how much cash they have. And in, in a downturn, if you expect a recession to come, cash is king. You, you will expect these companies sitting with lots of cash to be able to make acquisitions when the rest of the, uh, its competitors are staying away. That is the best time to make acquisitions. And with that cash, you can also um, expect to retain some of your best talent in a downturn. 
So I think um, that there needs to be a distinction. Not all tech is bad. And also in the longer term, whether interest rates go up or not, tech is, is, is going to be relevant in the longer run. So if you are a long-term investor, I think having a bit of tech exposure, I think it's good. But um, in a rising interest rate environment, I think it would be better for investors to focus on the higher quality, um, the, the big tech names over in the US. Yeah, definitely. This is uh, very insightful. So um, overall, we still prefer value um, over growth stocks. And also for tech, uh, we are looking at a quality, high company with good cash flow balance sheet. I hope uh, you guys have already taken down notes on this. So uh, moving on to the next questions. Uh, it's not really on equities, but um, it's on uh, fixed income. So there's one question about um, treasury bills, uh, Singapore tea bills, which I do believe everyone here had heard of it, or if not already subscribed for it. So I think somebody um, could be new asking like what's the differentiation between like Singapore savings bonds, uh, Singapore government bonds and T-bills and um, she's asking which one is better and also there's a second up question leading to that is if we think equity markets are bottoming like you know the oncoming recession and all, should we still buy bonds or should we go into stocks? Yeah, so uh, I think uh, the similar similarity between both of them is uh, they are both government uh, treasuries, uh, government um, securities. So both are issued by the Singapore government, which are, are relatively safer, one of the safest uh, instruments out there for, for bonds. So they are AAA rated by um, credit, credit agencies. So um, the difference between T-bills and SSBs, uh, T-bills is mainly short uh, tenor government bonds. So they are issued within uh, for, for six months, or either six months or one year in uh, tenor. Whereas for SSBs, um, the, the maximum tenor is 10 years. However, uh, investors can have the flexibility to choose uh, when they can redeem the bond. So they are not um, affected by any secondary market uh, fluctuations in their bond price. Because um, let's say you want to hold the SSB for three years, then uh, you can choose uh, to redeem it on the, the third year and still get back your principal uh, in full. So it will not be affected uh, by secondary uh, market pricing. Whereas for, for T-bills and also uh, SGS, when you sell it on the secondary market, um, it will be affected by secondary uh, bond pricing. On top of that, um, SSB also have a rather unique feature, which is the uh, step-up coupon. So uh, every year, uh, the SSBs will actually step up in uh, interest payments. So um, uh, yeah, compared to regular um, SGS or T-bills, uh, where they give a fixed regular coupon payment, SSBs actually gave a uh, increasing uh, uh, coupon payment. Which overall, if you hold it for the total of ten years, uh, you have a you see an increase in your interest uh, uh, total interest uh, rates. So uh, I guess in terms of the question of which one is better, uh, I guess it depends on um, your investment. Um, horizon and also your, uh, on, and, and how, how long do you want to hold your investments for. So if you want to hold it for a short term, uh, definitely T-bills is, is um, more, much more attractive because they give number one higher rates for just only six months or one year. Whereas um, T-bills, um, if you want to lock in the rates uh, for higher, for, long, uh, for much longer, um, you can definitely uh, consider SSBs uh, as, um, you know, you, you can still have the flexibility to, to redeem when you want because uh, SSBs still have, um, still provide you the choice to actually redeem uh, without, uh, redeem your principal in full. So, um, yeah, so lastly, on the question of whether um, uh, T-bills or SSBs are uh, investment choice, uh, as we head into a recession and with the equities bottoming, um, I guess mainly it's um, it, like 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 during my presentation just now. Uh, I think bonds uh, do provide uh, stable income during a recession, and they tend to actually uh, perform better during a recession. So definitely, as we head into uh, economic slowdown and a possible recession around the world, um, bonds do have a place in your portfolio. And definitely, I think the second part is uh, diversification. We, uh, even though you know you expect equity markets to maybe um, bottom up and 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 perform much better than bonds, but definitely um, bonds still uh, is able to provide um, uh, capital protection and uh, provide some divers diversification uh, for your portfolio. So um, yeah, so even if you uh, 
uh, still want to invest in equities, but I think uh, you, you should still allocate a certain amount uh, of your allocation into bonds. I think just to add on to what Teng Chong said, um, I think with regards to fixed income as well as equities, I uh, shared in my presentation earlier in the morning or so, one thing that you can look at is the relative valuations between the two asset classes. So right now, the earnings and uh, bond yield spread is currently at about 3.2%. And that also indicates that at this point in time, equities, they are relatively less attractive compared to bonds, which is why in our house view, we favor fixed income over equities. So if you're thinking about when to invest in equities, perhaps you can pay attention to the earnings bond yield spread. And when this spread level increases back to uh, higher levels, then you can consider allocating more capital to equities. Yeah, I was about to just chime in with um, a, a comment that I think if you look at um, 2022, that really is nothing that has done well in 2022. Pretty much everything has sold off. In stock markets, all the speculative excesses have already been flushed out. Bond markets have also sold off steeply as well, which also means that valuations across both equity and fixed income markets, they are a lot cheaper compared to one year ago. Which also means that if you have been waiting for a good time to you know, do your investments, I think 2023 is a good starting point for, for all of us because now everything is significantly cheaper compared to one year ago. I think we, we can at least take heart from, from the fact that at least now our expected returns in the future are probably higher because of the lower valuations. Okay, Ken, thank you. Um, so because of time constraint, uh, we'll just take one last question. It's about uh, this client asking about the Bank of Japan uh, widening of its uh, bond yield uh, control curve. Uh, it is positive for yen bonds and JPY, um, but it's negative for Japanese equities. So how come we are still um, recommending um, Jap equities and one of our investment outlook? Uh, yep, I'll take this question. So I think for um, the, the, the yield curve control that the BOJ has uh, implemented, um, I think Japan is one of those uh, places in the world right now that is still implementing uh, uh, um, easy monetary policy. Um, China, they have also been doing that, but the reason why China has been able to maintain that uh, policy is because it has capital controls in place. Japan doesn't have that which is why its easy monetary policy in 2022 has led to a very sharp decline in, uh, in, in the Japanese yen. So when the Fed raises its interest rates, um, developed countries, uh, or, or rather central banks across the world, most of them, they probably will have to take cue from the Fed. They all have to raise their interest rates. If not, they risk a sharp depreciation in their currency, which was what happened to Japan. So, um, so the fact that they have recently adjusted um, the the uh, U curve policy. It also suggests that perhaps an easy monetary policy is no longer something that is sustainable. Perhaps they are looking at the start of tightening their monetary policy, moving away from the ultra low interest rate environment that they have been in um, for 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 the past few years. So um, there are several implications from this with um, rising interest rates in Japan. So I think um, the investor said um, this is actually good for bonds. Uh, no, that is actually not good for bonds because when uh, interest rates rise, bond prices decline. So this is a negative for, um, for Japanese bonds. For the currency, it is a positive. So for 2023, if you want to bet on a currency, you can actually try betting on a Japanese yen to rebound. Um, and as for Japanese um, equities, in general, it is a negative. In a rising interest rate environment, um, it is um, generally a negative thing for, for equities. But for Japanese equities, I think there are certain things to, um, that differentiates them from the rest of the world. Uh, firstly, it's because um, Japan is in the midst of opening up to the world. Uh, I think number two, um, it is also one of the few markets where the companies are flushed with cash. If you look at Japanese companies, in the past, they have been discounted because they have been holding too much cash on their balance sheets. When times are good, if you don't deploy your cash, then investors will not be happy about it because you could potentially be making uh, more acquisition to turbocharge your growth. So investors have discounted Japanese equities in the past because of the fact that they are holding too much cash on their balance sheets. But as I've said just now, heading into a recession, this cash pulse that they have been holding on for the past few years, it suddenly becomes more attractive, especially against the backdrop of a slowing macroeconomic backdrop um, at, at the global level. So Japanese companies, balance sheets, they are flush with cash. Fundamentals are strong. 
And last but not least, I think that's the yen factor. So it doesn't matter what um, Japanese assets that you invest in in 2023, if you have exposure to yen, uh, you will get that additional return um, from uh, a potential appreciation in the Japanese yen as well. So I think all things considered, I think yeah, in a rising interest rate environment, it's generally bad for equities, but for Japanese equities in particular, uh, especially when compared to your other alternative markets, uh, I think Japanese um, equities, it is probably something that uh, you should consider um, for, for your equity exposure. Thank you so much for all our panellists. Um, they are very insightful perspectives. So we have drawn uh, to a conclu uh, con uh, I mean, wrap up the time here and I will pass the time back to Chris uh, for the lucky draw. Yeah, thank you so much for staying behind. Yeah. Yes, indeed. Ladies and gentlemen, let's give it up for our panellists.